Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings insights, perspective, and attitudes of our always thoughtful Democratic guests. Our focus today is on local government, and our guest is former Campbell mayor and current supervisorial candidate, Jason Baker. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming. So Jason, our, our viewers are often interested in understanding, uh, learning from city leaders and community leaders, uh, how they came to be in community life. And so, you know, where did you grow up and what experience did you have in growing up that kind of brought you to public service and community life? Yeah, well, I grew up, um, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, in uh, Utah, and actually a small mining town outside of there called Copperton. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up uh, pretty modest means. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I was on uh, free and reduced lunch. I grew up on um, some welfare for a while. And so that really helped shape um, my life since then. Uh, it's really been about public service, about trying to help one another and uh, work for good government. And ever since then, I have, from being a firefighter to a public health researcher to a public interest lawyer to a mayor, it's been all about trying to make the world better for all of us. I see. How long did you live in Utah? Did you uh, live through childhood there? <clears throat> I lived uh, in Utah till I was, I did third grade in upstate New York. So second, but then I would go back and visit my dad um, for summers in Utah. So uh, Utah is definitely a formative place and part of the reason I care about the environment a lot because uh, they have great things in Utah. I see. What brought you to New York? Uh, my parents, uh, my mom and stepdad, um, both were getting their degrees, their um, PhDs in English. So they're um, English professors and are still to this day. So they were getting degrees in, they got their uh, masters in Utah and PhDs in uh, New York and then wanted to go somewhere where it was sunny. So I they see. went to uh, California. I see. So after New York, they wanted more sunshine. That's right. What age were you about when you uh, when you were living in New York? It was the, uh, what was the campus life? So, uh, you know, it's funny. That's the smell of uh, used bookstores and, uh, and campus libraries mm. still uh, reminds me of, of home because I really grew up on, um, a campus, uh, learning, you know, going to poetry readings and learning wow. about, um, you know, libraries. It's part of the reason uh, I love libraries and, and learning today. I got my start in politics working on a library bond measure in Campbell. I see. Yes. And uh, at what age did you move out to California? Uh, I did eighth grade in uh, in California. I did um, middle school and then high school in Fresno. Fabulous. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Um, what, what brought you to being a life as a firefighter? Where were you a firefighter and you know, how long ago was that? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, there's a goofy picture on my website if you want of me uh, with fire and a, a big beard because I didn't shave the whole season. I was a forest firefighter. I see. So I would get called, um, I had a pager on my side and we would have to, and that's when there were pagers. Uh, and there yes. was, uh, uh, they would go off and we'd have to be on the bus with all our stuff in two hours. Wow. And they would uh, drive us up to Northern California to Chico uh, a lot of times and we get, um, get based out of there and go into wildfires on sometimes on helicopters without doors. Wow. It was exciting and, and part of the reason I did it was uh, because I knew that later on I wanted to maybe have a, a career in law and politics and you know sort of move paper from one side of the desk to the other and I thought it was important to know sort of what it's like to dig ditches and swing an ax and do real hard work and right. that informs my work um, every day when I'm mm -hmm. uh, doing public policy. Now the beard, uh, we'll come back to that because it's an <laughs> no, interesting no. choice. It's an interesting choice for a firefighting job. I would always be worried about my beard catching on fire, but uh, <laughs> but I, uh, out in the woods, that's a different story. Were you like living in the woods, waiting for this call, or were you down in Fresno? Or no, I was. was, a, I was like? This was a college. I was uh, at UC Davis, and so it was a job I had in college. Um, and you know, it made some good money too. And yeah. once you're, I was out in the forest almost almost the entire time, so I didn't have a lot of places to spend the money. So it was a nice way to have a paycheck and not and do the usual thing when you're a kid and spend it all on you know, yes. movies and everything else. Yes, I had that experience in the Navy and paid <laughs> almost nothing, but if you're away from places where you can spend money, it accumulates a little bit at least. Right, so. exactly, Good. that was it. What did you study in school? Uh, political science, and then I had enough units for uh, history and English minors, but I never, never filed for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always liked uh, policy and politics and the way th government can help us um, do better together. I see. And for the history and English, were you taking extra classes out of interest, or uh, really? Okay. Yeah, I love I love history. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talked my way into some upper division history classes that I wasn't technically allowed to be in mm -hmm. um, because I really enjoyed um, studying history, and I think you can learn from it, um, and it's, it's just fascinating. Um, were there other students at Davis at the time? It was Davis, right? Yeah. yeah were, there, were there other students who were doing the firefighter thing? How did you get involved with that? Yeah, they, um, they, the U.S. Forest Service advertises um, on, on campus and says, hey, if you want this job. And a few, you know, a few students, I think there was a 15-person crew, mm. I think, um, out of UC Davis. And we had a reputation for being a good you know, college crew, so we got to do, a lot of times, be in with the, um, with the hot shots, mm -hmm. um, who were the first in and, and the, the really tough guys mm -hmm. um, and women, um, and uh, the, first, the last out. 
Wow. I see. It was, it was wow. good. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. They must need a lot of manpower for that or people power because uh, I know that tragically they lost some some inmates who were working in, in uh, forest fighting. Was that as part of the same service or yeah, an we, auxiliary to that? Yeah, we called them con crews. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's nice or not, but they were mm -hmm. um, uh, inmate um, crews worked as hard as any other crew I've seen. They, they worked really hard because they were happy to be out there. Yeah. It was a terrific way to get people who were serving time, get them out in the open. They were, I felt totally safe around them, and I felt they were, they were really effective um, Effective crews. I was mm -hmm. glad they were there. But it's a dangerous work, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Did people appreciate that, or did you, did you feel well trained to handle the danger? Um, I did feel well trained. Um, and a lot of times, our um, our crew chief was a smoke jumper, um, taking time off, like relaxing from being a smoke jumper That's to cool. come help out some crews. I don't know. That what's the, a smoke jumper? Uh, exactly so a smoke jumper are the are the men and women who get on a plane and parachute into a fire with all their equipment um, and then and try to cut line in I ways see. that's that are inaccessible to anything else. It's an amazing see. work. It's incredibly um, uh, dangerous and, and difficult. Wow. Um, I don't know that I appreciated the danger as much until I was out on a fire um, and there was a uh, in Col I was in California and. Um, there was a Storm King Mountain fire in Colorado where some smoke jumpers actually died. They got mm -hmm. burned over, and they announced this over the loudspeaker at my um, at my camp. And mm -hmm. so we were hearing it's almost like the you know mash the old school. You know, right. We're hearing this, and you're thinking, yeah, the, those those folks who are way better at this than I am, and way better prepared and trained, um, had an incident. You know, it could happen. Right, and it's good that you were you were sensitive to that. Did you do that for the time you were in college and then moved on to other yeah, work I after? Uh, I like to say I didn't do it very long and I wasn't mm -hmm. very good about it. Yes. Uh, good, good at it, um, yeah. but it taught me a lot. I, my, yeah. my best job at it was to, to feed the big guys my bigger my sandwiches. Because right. we would always get one <laughs> turkey and one ham. I don't know yeah. if that's the, how, how they do it in the Navy. Right. And I wasn't big enough to need two sandwiches, so right. I give, yeah. give the workhorses. Yeah, one could burn a lot of calories fighting a fire. Just, yeah. uh, I'd burn a lot of calories worrying about it. <laughs> so, that's right. Good. And so um, after school, where did you end up? Did you come to the Bay Area at that point or was yes. it later? Yeah, so no, um, right after, um, oh, that, I tricked you, that's not true. Um, I spent two years in between undergraduate school and um, and law school. I stayed in Davis, mm -hmm. so I did five years at Davis undergrad and then two more years I lived in Davis. And I worked in Sacramento for the UC Davis um, Medical Center doing uh, gun violence health policy research. I Essentially, see. we studied gun violence like a disease. Mm -hmm. Wow. I thought it was illegal to do that because of a Republican administration policy. That, that's, that's how I lost my first job. The first really? and only job oh. I've ever sort of lost and been fired from, it was because the Republicans cut funding for studying um, gun violence from a health policy perspective. Wow. How interesting. Um, I, was, I was an actual casualty of that, and I'm glad wow. that just recently we started getting some of that back yes. because uh, one of our best weapons in a lot of these fights is data, is information. Right. You know, And I, I, at that agency, I worked for an ER doctor who uh, also was a public health professional, MD, MPH, mm -hmm. who just got tired of seeing kids shot in his ER. And so said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study this and say, okay, if you encounter a gun, what does that do for your outcomes in terms of criminal history and everything else? And wow. do, you know, um, amazing work, his name's Garen Wintemute. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, when they cut his funding, he spent a million dollars of his own money to keep that health research going. Wow. Uh, he wasn't rich, he was just a doctor, uh, but didn't have a lot of expenses. Yes. And, and uh, he did it because he believed in trying to keep us safer. It's a very interesting uh, and, and troubling aspect of sort of the current political environment that um, uh, there's, there's a, you know, there's the denial of climate science and and a desire to not have factual information be developed so that it can be used to, to, to attain sensible policy. So I hope you'll hold that against the Republicans in your public life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's um, if if you know, libraries and education are our best tools. Um, and foundations of democracy, I think sort of the opposite of that is suppressing information and having false facts out there, taking off information off the EPA webpage. Right. It's just pernicious yes. and, and evil. Yeah, I mean, it's shocking, and it's beyond know. that. They're, they're apparently um, uh, screening communications and screening proposals to, to eliminate uh, the, these uh, things that would develop the factual information, so I think it's quite shocking. Yeah, so, and wrong. Yeah, exactly. So in your, um, uh, in your work uh, as, a, uh, as a councilman, we'll talk more about that, but I'm just curious if your experience in firefighting and if your experience uh, with uh, gun violence uh, ever sort of informed policy debate that you participated in. Did those things come before you? Yeah, I think, you know, when, I, when people get nervous about pensions for first responders, mm -hmm. um, having been there, I mean, I, there was, I was on a fire once where we um, lit a backfire the night before, intentionally burned down some trees to make an area that was not burnable for the big fire. Mm -hmm. And the next day, the big fire burned over our, our helipad where we where helicoptered into, burned over our path back up to that helipad, so we had to go somewhere else. And if we hadn't built that backfire, we wouldn't have made it out. Like, mm -hmm. that was our only escape route was the still smoldering area that we burnt the night before. Right. And it was a split second decision. Uh, and that's the moment, you know, you're a firefighter looking at your, your shake and bake. We had these things that are like essentially high tech aluminum foil that you put over yourself. Your last chance. Yeah. And shelter. It's, it is, it's not a good day if that's, if you're, you're even looking at that. Mm -hmm. And I was there and, um, 
So when people start saying, well, these firefighters are getting paid, you know, um, too much or their pensions are too big or there they're, they're, they're shouldn't be, you know, two, two people, two, you know, four people engine, on engines, uh, you know, I wasn't a shelter fire person. I, I wouldn't do it. But it is a very cogent reminder of how much our first responders put on the line. And, and it also helped me want to do some of the things I did. I, I was on the um, interoperability authority in our county, mm -hmm. which helped get radios f um, so that uh, throughout the county, firefighters and police can talk to one another on the same radio system. Right. Um, that's and, fabulous. Remember, that was one of the big problems that uh, were identified in the 9-11 response. That's, so many different agencies responded and they couldn't coordinate directly. Yeah, not a lot of people know that. But that's yeah, right. That was a, yeah. It was a out of the 9-11 commission came a recommendation because you had all these agencies uh, in the, uh, responding to 9-11 and they couldn't communicate well. And communication is so important in an incident like that. Right. And same thing with the Boston bombing situation where you had Boston police, you had MIT police because it went under the campus, right. and then you had a small town police, and all of them responding and trying to communicate, and they were able to because they had a system like this. And now in Santa Clara County, in part because of the work I did, I chaired that for two years and I was a founding member of the board, I was on the first one. Um, we have that system up in place in most of the county, it should be in all of it soon. Good. And our first test was Super Bowl 50, and it went uh, ran with fi flying colors, and we were safer because of it. Right, wonderful, fabulous. Uh, so you finally did come to the Bay Area after the, I did. After yes, the job at the Davis Medical Center. Yeah, so then I went to a law school at Santa Clara Law. Um, oh, wonderful. I met my wife there for the first day. Uh, mm -hmm. It took me a year and a half to talk her into dating me, yes. but I did. And um, I got a great education from Santa Clara um, with a public interest bent. And it's one of the things I love about Santa Clara, mm -hmm. you know, run by Jesuits, and they really believe in giving back and community service. I see. And what, what, what do you mean by that? A public service bent in terms of the, <clears throat> the focus of your law classes and the skills you were developing? Um, uh, to, to an extent, I mean, to some extent, law classes are similar because mm -hmm. um, they got to teach you sort of the basics and they kind of teach you to, to think like a lawyer is what they say. So but, it's kind of a skill and it's how you use it that's important. Well, and the, the I mean, they have the um, ethics center on campus, the Markle mm -hmm. ethics, ethics Center there, and they had programs there. Mm -hmm. They had um, the uh, Catherine and George Alexander Law Center, mm -hmm. and I volunteered for that and was able to provide legal advice for free uh, for people who couldn't afford it. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the advice we provided was bankruptcy advice. Mm -hmm. I remember to this day, people would come in and say, look, you know, I've got all these bills. I'd like to declare bankruptcy. Can you help me? Uh, and, and these people were, you know, poor enough they couldn't afford a bankruptcy lawyer. Right. And uh, you know, nine times out of ten, you know what caused their bankruptcy was um, health care. Mm -hmm. And yes. so we'd have to tell those people, look, if if you've got health problems, don't declare bankruptcy because you're just going to be back in the same hole again. Right. So just ignore the creditors. Here's a here's a letter saying I'm uncollectible, um, and wait until hopefully your health problems get better. Interesting. Um, our health policy is progressed since then. Things are a little better. I'm going the wrong direction these days. But right. um, hopefully not too far. Yeah. But that's that's part of what the um, Santa Clara education offers is the uh, ability to give back. Fabulous. That's nice. And um, it's great that uh, it's great that you had that experience in, 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 in working with people in need and, and using law as a uh, as a tool. Um, has, th has that uh, emerged in other aspects of your life or uh, your yeah. professional life as a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. So I've dedicated my professional life to um, to trying to help others, um, especially those who don't ordinarily have a voice. So I, uh, among the work I got to do at the uh, Catherine and George Alexander Law Center was a little bit of class action consumer protection work. Wow. I got to help people who were being defrauded um, uh, based on their on car purchases and other kinds of things. Yeah. And that helped me um, get a job. That and also I, I interned at the special litigation division at, in the city and county of San Francisco, um, suing gun manufacturers on behalf of San Francisco and also the county. So I, I rep helped represent the county right. a long time ago, and I, I am well aware that they can do good good work. Fabulous. Well, it's great to get that background on, on you, Jason. We're going to take a short break, and we'll come back and talk about your um, more of your public life. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. We're back with former Campbell mayor and current supervisorial candidate Jason Baker. Jason, thanks for being with us. And thanks for the information you shared with us uh, in the first part of our show. In this segment, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your experience uh, as a council member and, and mayor in Campbell. How did, how did you come to decide to run? What brought you to that? You know, I think I've always wanted to do public service, even from when I was a kid. Um, and then there was an opening on the Campbell Council. My son was, I think, four months old when I first ran. Wow. So I was, uh, it was not easy, but I was knocking on doors with a, with a stroller and saying hello, and I'm running for, for a council. Right. Did you ever knock on doors with one of those baby Bjorn things that the baby strapped to you? <laughs> you know, I didn't because my uh, my son had a little uh, spinning up issue, and so you, we couldn't use a baby Bjorn. That would be him. a mess. Okay. Yeah. We, learned, we learned real quick what that baby Bjorns didn't Good. work. But I did have a stroller in it. Good. It helped me people get 
uh, my message across to the people that I really do. I and mean, part of the reason I do it is for the, for the kids. Well, in seriousness, it's, uh, it's hard to do uh, focus on anything when you have a, a new baby. And uh, I wonder, was there something very compelling going on that you, got you interested and made you feel like that was the time to do it despite having a young one? Well, you know, I, I had just finished working on that library ballot measure I mentioned I see. earlier. So uh, it was to try to pass a bond measure to keep library funding throughout the county, even in, in pretty tough economic times. Right. And I think then, maybe especially then, libraries are so important mm -hmm. for people to be able to get a free source of education. So right. I'd kind of gotten to know some of the folks I'd served on the Campbell Civic Improvement Commission for three years working on public art and parks and libraries right. uh, and it really kind of got me excited about the uh, hope and promise of good government. Yes, Campbell has nice civic facilities. They have nice nice public buildings and spaces. Thank you. Yes, I, I worked hard for it. Good. <laughs> we just, when I was mayor, we spent three million dollars, uh, agreed to spend three million dollars investing in parks. Wow. We put in a new park when, during the recession, which was not an easy thing to do. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, that's part of the reason Campbell is so uh, beloved even countywide is because um, our community center, our parks are uh, our top notch. Right, lovely. And uh, the, the library bond, did that work out? Did it, it, did. it did. It did, and then as, as uh, vice chair and then chair of the library board, I worked on the next one 10 years later. Oh, okay. And that passed too. Oh, um, and, and Campbell both times voted the highest in the county, I think, um, to pass that measure because yes. we really value education in libraries. Yes, well, I appreciate that work. I know that as Democrats, we always uh, one of the things that can make us feel good is to go to a public library or a school and see kids learning and enjoying books, and, and so it's it's important work. Yeah. So, what issues came before you in the council uh, in Campbell? What, uh, what 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 memorable occurrences? What things are you proud of? Yeah, a lot. Um, so I was on Campbell Council for eight years, and I was mayor twice, uh, and we did a lot of work. I think uh, the work. I'm most proud of was some of my regional work. Mm -hmm. I was on the Valley Transportation Authority mm -hmm. and also the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is a nine county transportation body. You know, my first, to give you a sense of scale, my first vote on that board on MTC was $900 million for train cars for San Francisco. Wow. My second vote the same day was to put the lights back up on the Bay Bridge, which I'm pretty proud of. Wow. Um, I'm yeah. a big fan of public art. So I think my work on transportation has been, um, I've, I've been proud of. It's been, uh, because everybody has to get somewhere. You know, BTA and MTC, they deal with, you know, walking, biking, um, trains, buses, everything, uh, and it crosses socioeconomic groups and everything else. What are the sort of housing and transportation issues that particularly uh, uh, affected Campbell, and, and what were the involvements, and how did that connect to that regional work? Yeah, so I think that um, you're right to say housing and transportation, because mm -hmm. they're, um, uh, they're inextricably linked. The affordable housing is an issue throughout the county, throughout the region, mm -hmm. and throughout the state. Um, and I always say, like, affordable housing is not just about helping people who can't afford a house being nice. Mm. It's about our survival as a region. Mm. It's about us continuing to be Silicon Valley and having that drive. Because there are other regions in the in the country and in the world who want to be us. Mm. Denver and Seattle and other places. And one of the ways they compete against us and try to beat us out is through because of affordable housing and traffic. So mm. I, I worked hard on those. And I think I put my money where my mouth was. We put four and five story condos, a four story and a five story condos and apartments in downtown Campbell, mm -hmm. 75 feet from light rail. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not easy to get done in Campbell. You can't get elected in Campbell unless you write small town feel. And I believe in, in the small town feel in Campbell. I just think that the way you protect those, uh, those uh, single family homes is put density where it belongs, in downtown, next to light rail, where people can walk and bike to the prune yard and to downtown. And that helps us with traffic, that helps us with parking, helps us with greenhouse gases, um, and it helps protect those other neighborhoods and keeps Campbell feeling Campbell. So in, uh, in Campbell in particular, because this dynamic plays out so much um, in, uh, throughout the area, and I'm very interested in your perspective from the regional planning point of view, um, but uh, developments of four stories or five stories usually turn out some opposition. Did you have organized opposition to those projects in yeah, Campbell? Yeah, I did, and there was um, there was people who were who were nervous and who will be, continue to be nervous. But I think that they they understood, and, and I had this discussion one on one with some of my earliest backers. You know, mm -hmm. people on the historic preservation board who were nervous about that kind of density. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we were able to come to an agreement at the end of the day that you know. We've got that light rail station there. It's right next to light rail. It will help all the other things that I talked about. And also, we did get a lot of affordable housing. And I think that everybody understands we need more affordable housing because the way that, uh, and part of the way you get that is both building a little bit of density where it makes sense, and also by re giving the developers that, de that density, you can get some affordable housing concessions in return. And so, so those developments have some affordable housing. Uh, so folks will be able to live close to downtown. You know, if we don't do it, the way we're planning now is just really anti-family. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, my wife and I got into a house, we can live there, but grandparents can't live here sometimes. Okay. Grandkids won't be able to live here. Oh, our own kids. Yeah, yeah. And, and it doesn't make sense. We've got to do better. And, and I try to do some of that both on Campbell Council and also regionally.
Interesting. The uh, one argument you often hear, and I wonder if you heard this in, in, in relation to these or other projects in Campbell, is the idea that, um, uh, well, it's the, it's the NIMBY uh, attitude. It's like, I, don't want, I, I believe and understand the theory of high density housing by rail, but I don't really want it by me. It's not suitable in my community because of the character and nature of my community. And, um, or that it's more suitable in San Jose or, or in open spaces in other parts of the county. Did you hear those arguments? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we do have a housing crisis mm -hmm. and we need to treat it like a crisis, not just say it's a crisis, but mm -hmm. treat it like a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the more people do understand this hits home and, and we really could lose the good thing we have if people can't afford to live here. Um, but also I think there's a, a, a time and a place um, for making sure that housing goes in the right places. So I think, so one of the things I worked on uh, as president of the Cities Association, which is our group of mostly mayors, it's 15, um, each city gets one vote, and we mm -hmm. meet at 7 tonight at night and Thursday nights and try to deal with regional pro problems. What regional area does that group cover? So so it's the whole county. It's, one, every city gets one vote, and I mostly see. it's the mayors that appoint themselves. I was on that for a number of years until I got to be president of the body. And when I was, I made um, what's called a regional housing needs assessment mm -hmm. sub-region uh, one of our priorities, and that's mm -hmm. uh, that idea is still continuing. I hope we can get there, and that's a means of saying, okay, if there are some communities where density like that really doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. you know, Los, in Los Gatos, uh, building high density up in the hills just really doesn't make sense. Um, Montesorino, you know, doesn't have any commercial. Then those communities can dedicate some of their transportation dollars, for instance, some mm -hmm. some resources to San Jose or Milpitas that do have a lot more capacity for. Um, density and sort of make a, a market. So you say, look, you can't you can't just say no to density and not have to give some resources in exchange. Right. But as a region, we can make those decisions rather than forcing density right. on some of the smaller cities where it might make less sense for everybody. Did you, did you ever wish there were a regional like czar who could just dictate that uh, you, you have to take this many units and you have to take this many units? Well, there is. Uh, it, there's, so there's um, the, um, the state says, it gives you those regional housing needs assessment numbers and says mm -hmm. you, that the cities must plan for those for you know, a certain number of affordable units and very low to try to get cities to do that, that kind of thing. Cities are you know, better or worse about um, living up to those numbers. Campbell did a pretty good job. Um, I think that uh, you know the issue is that the regional czar would have to know these communities, and I think that's part of the part of the argument for doing it on a regional basis is because we can all sit around a table and we have mm -hmm. and talk about. Look, you know, I think density is important. I think affordable housing is important, but I don't think that you know uh, Los Gatos is in the same situation as San Jose or Milpitas. Right. So let's find ways to pool our resources in terms of transportation dollars um, and and put density, definitely put density in our region, but put it where it belongs. It's, it sounds like you're in favor of the model that has uh, retains local control over decisions, but maybe with mechanisms, effective mechanisms for communities to coordinate to attain some kind of regional goal or obligation. I think that's right. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense because uh, I think you you will lose a lot of people um, if you start just trying to, and, and it just, you, you can make the wrong decisions by accident if you don't know the communities as well as their, their mayors. And right. Part of the reason I'm endorsed by most of the mayors and vice mayors in the county for this race is I have been able to make those regional agreements. People have seen my work and they know that I care about um, the communities in our county. I see. And uh, turning to your race, your current race for supervisor. It's, oh, yeah, uh, that. Uh, yes. I'm Sup running for supervisor. Exactly. And you're running for supervisor in District 4. Which communities are within District 4? So that's Ken Yeager's seat. He's termed out. Mm -hmm. I'm not foolish enough to run against him. I think he's done mm -hmm. a, a terrific job, and, and uh, we'll have big shoes to fill whoever gets this uh, the job. So it's um, parts of San Jose. Essentially, Campbell's right in the middle, and then you have three districts in, in San Jose, and then Santa Clara. I see. Yeah. Good. So. And, and what motivates you to run for supervisor? You know, I love the work. I've, I've worked, I've served on county boards and commissions um, and, and regionally beyond our county boards and commissions. Um, and I've served with every uh, sitting supervisor there is. Um, I have more regional experience than any of the candidates running. And I want to keep doing that. Um, the regional stage is very interesting. It matters. Mm -hmm. and, and really, at the end of the day, I mean, I'll tell you an anecdote that maybe answers the question better. I, you know, as my kids get older, it was actually easier when, when they were babies because mm -hmm. they don't understand what's kind of going on. And But when my son what was... What was easier? It was easier being involved in politics. Uh, easy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Going to the nighttime meetings I and, see. you know, missing jammy time, uh, which is hard, you know. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a downside of the job, because right. especially as I did it, I, I put my all into it because I love the work. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it matters to people. Mm -hmm. But as my son got older, he started, you know, he'd see me put a tie on at night and said, you know, why are you going to, are you going to a meeting? And right. he's like, I know what that means. Yeah. Um, and you know, in fact, we would read Harry Potter to our kids at night, uh, but not unless we were both there, my wife and I. And so it would mean missing out on Harry Potter, Potter that night. which yeah. is tough, right? That's tough mm -hmm. for a dad. But one of the nights he asked me, are you, why are you going to a meeting? Why are you putting a tie on? I said, you know, uh, we were going to ban plastic bags that night. And, mm -hmm. and I was able to say, you know what? You know why I'm doing it? It's because we're actually going to make the world a little bit better for you and for us. We're going to make mm -hmm. the, the, the creeks cleaner. And data just came out that said we did, um, mm -hmm. at least in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, we're literally going to make the world a little bit better for you um, and for your future. And so that's why I'm going. And I, I don't want to miss jammy time, but this work is important um, for you and for us and for the world. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm doing it. What, what do you think like, the big challenges will be if you get the position? What, what are the hard things to do? Um, a lot of it's hard. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the county, not a lot of folks know how much the county does, how broad it is. It's six and a half billion dollars, give or take, uh, annual budget. Mm -hmm. Plus, we just voted for seven and a half billion dollars in taxes. Six mm -hmm. and a half for transportation, and I was an early and key leader on that transportation measure, and also another almost billion dollars for homeless and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges, and one of the reasons I, I, am, I, I want this job and think I would be good at it, is we need to make sure that money is spent well. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, some, we Democrats believe that there can be good government. Government can good, do good things like help solve homelessness, and we might get there. Mm -hmm. Help solve our transportation and traffic problems. Because mm -hmm. if you're in traffic, it's just stealing time out of your life that you aren't spending at the job you hopefully love or with your kids. It's, right. it's a serious issue. Right. We've got to make sure that money is spent effectively, carefully, and, and well. And that's, I think that would be one of the challenges. If, uh, if a viewer were inspired by your responses to my insightful questions, <laughs> uh, no, your insightful responses to my questions, how would they reach out to your campaign? How so would they reach you? My website's uh, pretty easy. It's uh, www.jasonbaker.vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and the email is jason at jasonbaker.vote. And they can call me uh, on a phone that rolls over to my cell phone, which is 408 426 Eight six six seven. I hope folks will get involved. I've got a bunch of Santa Clara interns helping me out. Smart, Good. great people, uh, and uh, the campaign's going strong. Wonderful. Good. Well, thank you for all the information and uh, insights you've shared with us today, Jason. It was nice to get to know you and uh, to share some of your background and your experience and inspiration with our viewers. Thank you for watching DTV. Give us a call at four zero eight. 445-9500 or visit our website at www.sccdp.org. Help us to make a difference. We'll see you on the campaign trail.